Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and today we are very fortunate to have my dear friend and the amazing polyglot influencer of the language learning world, <laughs> Richard Simcott. <laughs> How are you doing mate? Wow, thank you very much. What an introduction. So Tell you what. pleased to be with you again and to talk to you Robin. Um, we had a great chat on Instagram uh, the other week and loved it and I loved all of the feedback that I, I saw from my side and um, you know, speaking to you is always a treat. So what can I say? Thank you for having me. Absolutely, yeah. And please, anyone who is not already following Richard on Instagram, his handle is speaking fluently. Please do go check out the chat that we had. It's saved as a Instagram live TV thing. IG TV thing. Yeah. Um, but it really was just a really nice chat. I had loads of direct messages, people, and the, the feedback I got from almost everybody was, it was just a really nice conversation. Like a really, really nice conversation. So such a pleasure to chat with you as always. Yeah, well, I think it's that's just the way it goes, isn't it? When you sort of just get on and you, you know each other and you get on well and it's yeah. just a natural thing, right? It's not like the interview sort of, oh, you asked me questions and I sort of don't know what, yeah. quite, quite know what to say. And uh, there's a lot of shared experience as well, isn't it, between us? So Exactly, helps. yeah. So this is really just a hangout, you know, we're, we're, we're just bringing everyone else into the hangout. Um, and so in case anyone doesn't know Richard, um, Richard is a pretty spectacular language learner, polyglot. I think Richard is certainly one of the more influential people in the online language learning community, both today with the stuff that he's doing right now, but also just going all the way back to what we might kind of call the beginning of the online, certainly polyglot community, um, which I think has really now at this point just blossomed into a much larger, broader language learning community. Um, Richard was one of the first people to do sort of these polyglot videos speaking different languages, um, which was 13 years ago now, I believe he said. Um, yeah, 13 years ago. I mean, I couldn't have imagined what it would turn into. Um, yeah, course, it's a genre now. 13... It's a whole genre of sort of video right the polyglot you know thing i mean i never really imagined it and 13 years ago when i first made a video it was a 16 language video uh just sort mm -hmm. of using bits of some languages that i i'd studied right over the years and that was kind of the idea for me was sort of threefold um mm -hmm. the first and important most important features for me were to um to, to actually make contact with other people who love languages like i do um, because at that time the internet was very new, uh, finding such people was very difficult. I mean, if you imagine a YouTube with, uh, there was me, uh, Luca Lampariello and uh, Studio Raj, and that was it in terms right. of at that point when we first made the videos. Um, so this is before Dr. Arguez, um came on, because he was also pretty early, right? He was pretty early on. I don't know if he had a video like that though. Uh, right, right. He may have been around on YouTube a, a similar time. It, right. The, the memory gets a bit fuzzy uh, as the years <laughs> yeah. roll on. It was uh, mostly cat videos back then, I think, on YouTube. That was it. <laughs> Exclusively. Right. So it was basically you, Luca, Stu J. Raj. Yeah, and that was kind of it in terms of these polyglot videos, uh, these sort yeah. of speaking multiple languages. And I wanted to make contact with people like us because I knew there were people around the world, but I didn't know how common it was and sort of like a, hey, I'm here, you know, right, let's all sort of get together and, and meet up and get to know each other. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up in an environment where um, it was an unusual hobby to have, um, yeah. to say the least. I, I did feel supported, uh, but I could also imagine that having that kind of hobby in a less supportive environment would feel quite lonely. Um, yeah. Because already for me, I mean, it was it was strange that I liked so many languages and I expected that to be the case that when I go to university, everyone would feel the same way. And I did a degree in, in combined languages, which is a minimum of three languages. And I thought right. everyone on that course would feel exactly the same way as I do. But actually it wasn't really the case. It was, um, you know, more often than not, people who just liked one, two or three different languages and cultures and for different reasons. And they sort of went on and did their own things. There was, there was me and there was one other person who was on the same course who was a couple of years younger than I was uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, still, uh, you know, remained, you know, over the years, a couple of years younger. Yeah, but, I was going to um, say, <laughs> at the time. 
laughed at the time. A humble <laughs> brag that Richard has not aged as fast as other people. <laughs> yeah, and you know, at the time. But, you know, <laughs> you know, as I've been getting younger and younger, naturally, right. it, things have changed. Um, so, but seriously, I mean, apart from him, really, there wasn't really anyone else as into languages as, as we were. Yeah. And um, so we were definitely the, the strange sort of rare unicorns, I'd say. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and one of the other things, a sort of a side thing for me was whenever I'd go to a party or to an event or to family uh, things, you know, where people knew that I loved languages and loved them to this degree and mm-hmm. studied lots of them. Um, I would kind of be known before I arrived, if you know what I mean. It would be almost like, oh, he's the one. Oh, is that the one that mm-hmm. likes all the languages and speaks all the languages and whatever else? And, and so I, I realized that when YouTube hit, that there would be an element of people who would just like to be able to say, oh, that's the guy I met, uh, whatever, right. you know, or friends and family when I didn't know how big YouTube would be at that point. Um, right. But I, I recognized that I could make a video, it could be public, I could share it with friends and family who kept asking me to sort of do these demonstrations with their friends. And right. And it was a nice way for them to be able to show, show, show that thing that they wanted, to, the party trick. Um, mm-hmm. But it meant that it wasn't really costing me anything to do as well in terms of energy or time or anything like that. So there was kind of mm-hmm. the, that thing as well, I guess, as a third sort of less important for me. But I think for other people, I get it. I get, you know, if you meet somebody who, who does something that's a bit different, it's like, you know, if you have friends that sing well or play musical instruments or know certain things about certain subjects, it's kind of you want to hear from them about that thing, right? Yeah. So I get it. Yeah, I get for it. sure. Yeah. And, so and it did blossom. Things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it blossomed, I mean, at least in my memory, you know, rather quickly, or at least at a certain point, I feel like it started to escalate. I, I sort of, you know, was certainly inspired by those early videos because people, a lot of people don't realize I've been on YouTube myself now for seven years. Um, actually, longer than that. But... Uh, it took me a few years after starting to get inspired by people like yourself, um, you know, to actually come onto the scene. But it really blossomed. So uh, Richard is also the creator of, you know, the the International Polyglot Conference, which is also now sort of blossomed into a huge thing. And um, I know this was an interesting year, obviously, with the the new... Uh, situation normal. in the world the but it normal. sounds like you guys adapted <laughs> um oh, but yeah, yeah. so yeah needless to say rich has really been a huge part of the community but he's also i think uh really got an enormous amount of experience learning languages over a longer period and actually that sort of uh part of what i want to talk to you about today okay. in this particular video which is you know we i've you know talked a lot over the years about maintaining languages and i think this is such a crucial part of even just learning one language, right? Most of us, I think, are sort of doing this as a long-term project, a a sort of lifestyle. But certainly anyone who wants to be a polyglot or learn multiple languages, it's a long-term lifestyle. So I've often talked about, you know, techniques for how can we do this or that in the moment. But keeping in mind that this is something we do long-term, I think it's also cool to discuss, well, how does that language learning journey change and evolve as we do it for longer and longer. So I wanna talk to you about how or if it gets easier over time to maintain or sort of remember a language or to phrase it the opposite way, do you find that you forget languages sort of more slowly the longer that you have been learning them? And um, right before you answer, if I may, I just wanna give a quick, very quick background based on you know what I know about you, because you've got languages that you've been speaking since being very, very young, right? So just French. Um, mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, you've been, you've, French has been in your life since you, almost since you can remember, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so you've got languages like that. Then you've got these languages you learned at university, mm-hmm. uh, like Spanish. I remember Portuguese was one, mm-hmm. right? Uh, things like this. And these are also languages I think that you've spoken a lot in your life. If I remember correctly, Portuguese, though, was one that you didn't speak 
as much, and if I remember correctly, um, until you went to Brazil, really started doing a lot of stuff in Brazil. I remember you came back from Brazil with sort of a Brazilian Portuguese accent. Um, and then you've, so the point I'm trying to get across here is that you've got a lot of languages you've learned, but you've got languages that you've learned for really long periods of time and have used to different degrees. And so that's why I'm really interested is, you know, uh, are the languages that you've been interacting with for so many years, do you find they're just a lot more resilient um, these days or does it not really change? Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting question about sort of how, how languages remain or don't <laughs> in your head. Um, right. And it's not always a simple question to answer. Um, right. For the languages that I studied to sort of degree level and, and used for professionally, um, for sure, those languages, uh, to lose them completely, I think would be, would be pretty, pretty difficult. In terms right, like of like German, just, you yeah, were a network engineer in Germany. I remember you've got these languages that you did a lot of professional work in, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so so my, I worked in 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 sort of tech environments and customer services and marketing and a number of different environments in business with you know a, a good a good chunk of languages, and I think to forget them completely from to go so rusty that I can no longer use them. I think would take a lot just right. because when something's been part of your life for years I think you'd have to deliberately avoid using them and thinking about them and seeing them and reading them and all that kind of stuff and that would be quite difficult because my life has has brought you know just through the, the sheer moving around to different places and making friendships and working and having experiences in a number of countries um, mm -hmm. with the magic of the internet and social media platforms, I'm connected still to a lot of those people. Right, yeah. In a way that probably wasn't possible before. So I imagine, mm -hmm. you know, turn the clock back 30, 40 years ago, and if you were having this discussion with me after having um, studied the same languages and had the same experiences, I imagine it would have been a lot different because... I would have had to rely on literature um, mm -hmm. to, to stay in touch or writing letters or things like right. that and, and that would depend on a lot of things and to do that over so many languages would be a lot more difficult I guess um, whereas yeah. I get snippets of lots of languages every day all the time mm -hmm. um, just by things that I see on on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube, um, just around me, wherever I am as well. And so it's, it would be difficult to lose those languages. There are kind of a core set of languages, I think. I would probably say um, my core Romance, uh, Germanic and Slavic languages, it's difficult mm -hmm. to lose them completely. Um, yeah. There are definitely languages in those groups where I would say like Slovak, for example, where I studied it for a while and then I didn't really use it. I studied it for a very specific project for a, for a short period of time and it's kind of easy come, easy go with a language like that. Um, mm -hmm. You can make quite quick progress because, you know, if you've studied languages that are similar, you get a lot of free words, the grammar's not totally unknown to you. Uh, but yeah. then the flip side is the language then gets subsumed back into the, yeah. the other languages that used you use to help you learn it quickly. Yeah, that's what happens to me with Portuguese, I, I always find. Um, yeah. I've never had a really extended period of time where I've used it a lot. And frankly, I've just not really spoken it a lot with people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find that it sort of <laughs> gets consumed. Whereas for me, the thing that I think about, I imagine like a knife and it is this idea of sort of how a knife holds its edge, you know, where, you know, um, it might get rusty or it might lose that sort of sharpness more quickly or less quickly depending on the knife. So for me, the best example I have is Spanish where it was the first language I ever tried to learn myself. I was 16 and it has not been a smooth journey, right? It's like I learned it um, yeah, fairly okay when I was 16 going through high school in America. with some Hispanic students around me I could speak with, 
but I wasn't fluent by any measure, you know. And then it came back when I was in, you know, I, I ended up in some mountains in Mexico for like six weeks, crazy story. Mm -hmm. um, but that helped. Then it went away again. Like it's been this language that it's, it's come and gone, but it's been a part of my life for now 13 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so I find that it's so resilient now, even when I actually expect like, oh God, my Spanish is probably terrible now. You know, I haven't spoken it for months and months. I'll come back to it and it almost seems better <laughs> than it used to be. But Italian is way newer for me, right? And my mm -hmm. Italian at one point I would think was better than my Spanish is today, but I have so much less experience speaking out in the world. I have so much less time with that language. And so Italian, I find, is significantly less resilient. And so that's what kind of made me interested in this sort of idea that, yeah, there are things that we can do in, in a given moment to maintain a language, but there's also this component of how long we actually spend time with that language over the course of our lives. Um, yeah. Does Absolutely. that resonate with you at all? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there has certainly been, even with some of the languages I've studied to a higher level, I mean, you do you do notice sort of you get out of um, sync with with the culture or, or the country. Mm -hmm. It's normal if you if you're moving around, um, and that's fine. I kind of accept that. Where I find it's particularly challenging is where I study a language for a short period of time because I want to sort of get into it and understand the crux of the language, understand how the grammar works, just have a sort of a, a peek into the door of a new world, really, and so. Right languages that are unrelated to the other languages I use all the time I find will will go a lot more quickly they'll go very rusty so I've had this yeah. with Latvian I've had this with Finnish I had it with Indonesian and then sometimes I'll go back and I'll, I'll get, get back to the level I was at which might not mm -hmm. be very high but it's certainly just to communicate with people it's fine um, yeah. so I did that with Indonesian when the pandemic hit I was like do you know, I really loved Indonesia and I really loved the people and I really loved using the language and, and um, I want to get back to where I was. And so I I just found someone I talk to, uh, a teacher, and the teacher was brilliant. And I, my plan was to just do it over the summer. But because she was so nice, I just carried on. And um, just once a week of chats in Indonesian and, and, mm -hmm. and slowly but surely my Indonesian sort of came back and I was, now I can have kind of a yeah, basic conversation in Indonesian fairly, fairly well. Um, right. I'm not going to say I'm going to be sitting any C2 exams anytime soon, but it's... It, <laughs> That'll it, be it, next year. Yeah, yeah, next year. Give it a week <laughs> or two, you know. <laughs> right. Give him some time, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Man's got to work. He's got busy, busy, a busy life. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting, though. Um, yeah, that's certainly been... Uh, I, I'm always really fascinated, like I said. It's not just about losing it completely, but it's like how quickly or how easily languages for me can like lose their edge um, mm -hmm. and like I said for some reason I just have some um, like Portuguese or Swedish for me where I, I've never really gotten them terribly sharp to begin with um, mm -hmm. and so naturally they deteriorate a lot more quickly um, but so yeah it's very cool to hear about that um, part of your language learning experience because again I just we, we often talk about how do you do things right now how do you learn a language um, but yeah, since we're all doing this, hopefully for the long run, it's useful to discuss right. that, I think. I mean, look, I mean, I'll be honest with you, when it comes to like languages and the whole numbers game and how fluent are you and how much do you know and how many words do you know and how many characters do you know, and <laughs> it does get a little bit boring. Um, yeah. Simply because there's, there's nothing you win from, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you, no one comes along to you and says, like here's here's a prize you've, you've done it mm -hmm. you've sort of you, you've got to the end of it it's not it's you do it for sheer passion right you so i mean if your passion is in one language like some of the people at university that i met uh, their passion was in one language but they that was an admirable thing in and of itself and the fact mm -hmm. that i like different languages and want to experience a number of languages and I took some of my languages to a very high level uh, others I'm happy with kind of an intermediate others are kind of a, a lower intermediate beginner level and I, mm -hmm. I whatever for me is is fine um, and and so naturally if you have languages at different levels of course there's going to be some attrition and, and mm -hmm. they will they will get rusty it's um, it's a natural thing that happens and 
And and so this is kind of also another reason why for me it makes the numbers game so so uninteresting and so um, re- so irrelevant, I guess, yeah. uh, because it's it, it, it you can't really just keep adding to languages. You, you can say I studied. You can add it to the languages you studied, of course, because there mm-hmm. is kind of a compounding of information that helps to feed into new studies that you do. Because you'll remember, yeah. even if you've forgotten a lot of the language, right, as an active language, there are elements of the language that you will recall when you get to a new language. Oh, I studied a type of grammar that's like this from another language. And so it feels more, more sort of, feels easier to, to access and to understand. Um, yeah. It could be vocabulary, it could be whatever, you know, that it yeah. just helps, it gives you an inroad into a new language again. And, yeah. and so it's not for naught that you do this. And so I think the languages you study, does, it, it's good to study a number of languages, um, but doing it to say that you speak them all to whatever degree, uh, no one's looking for it for a job. Um, yeah, that was my experience very no, early on in my career. <laughs> no one's, no one, no, as I say, no one's gonna come along and give you a prize for doing it. Um, it's, it, you, I mean, if you don't love languages and you study a number of them and you're doing it for a numbers game, um, unfortunately you're gonna be bitterly disappointed. I agree because it comes with, um, you know, each new one that you add or study, it comes with a price in my opinion, right? And to me that price is, you know, for example, um, I'm, I'm much more interested usually in what are the experiences people have Right, that's fascinating to me. And it doesn't have to be real out there in the world. I mean, in your case, there's some wonderful stories, right? Of, it's not about, the the numbers aren't as interesting. To me, it's it's Mm. just really interesting hearing the experiences that you've had with certain languages, right? Whether that be in your professional life or your personal life or just things that you've done. In my case, there are things like the life I lived in Japan or the things I've done with French professionally that that are really fun stories. But there's also just stuff like some of the books I've read that are like some of, genuinely some of my dearest memories in my life are like the, the books I've read in French and how I, I actually fell in love with reading through French. And so just like a number doesn't really tell you much, uh, even if it mattered. It, we've all got such different experiences and relationships with those languages. But each one you add, you know, it's, it's something to think about because I've now struggled to engage in reading books in French over the last years, right? Because I've, and so I'm very careful and conscious these days about even thinking about adding a new language because that's ultimately less time that I'll then have for those other ones that I love. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, and this is where the rub is, right? And this is where I always think that every person is different. And, um, so for one person, what what's good for one person might not be good for the other person. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, in, in in my experience with language learning, um, I've met people who are monolingual, um, very very well read, extremely well read, and extremely well informed, and really master the language. And in, in, in fact, one person I met at university uh, was studying English, monolingual English speaker, um, and in terms of linguistic interest, I found as much, if not more, linguistic interest in my conversations with him as I have Mm -hmm. done with a number of people who speak multiple languages. Um, Simply because that level of ability in a singular language is actually extremely, I would say, more inspiring. Um, Yeah. um, and, And so I got a lot of motivation Sort of just speaking to him in terms of the linguistic study and and understanding and etymology and the conversations I had with him were, for me were, were fundamental to sort of my own growth uh, in in language learning and um, so whenever whenever I hear sort of quotes or or I sort of uh, you know these things that we share on as memes you know if, yeah. if you don't speak what if you don't speak more than one language then you you don't know your first language. I think that's nonsense. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I've met people who clearly do have a very good command of their own language, and only speak one language, and that's it's not a dichotomy that works. Um, it's a false dichotomy uh, to to sort of say that. And um, 
the other thing that sort of related to this is with travel and you have to go and live in other countries and you have to travel and you have to do this what's wrong with being content in the place you're born in and grew up in and just really loving life there the family mm-hmm. the friends the life that you build it's actually quite a nice thing to to have oh I, yeah and i you know as somebody like you as well who's traveled and lived in many different places i don't know don't you find that quite a romantic thought that's quite a nice thought oh to yeah think, yeah how lovely i mean would one it be? thing like for me living in places like san francisco where almost everybody's an expat right almost everybody's from somewhere else um there's a certain sort of instability that i at least have often felt where everybody's either coming or going and it can be kind of hard to make long-term friends whereas living in barcelona where most people i personally met they'd lived there their whole lives there are lots of expats but like i i tended to meet people who lived in all the sort of villages and small towns around it was so refreshing mm-hmm. it was so refreshing to meet people and be like oh this person like they just love being here and they're going to still be here next year and the year after and 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 you know the other thing that i cuz you see this thing of you know if you've only if you don't travel it basically you're not re- it's it's almost equated to how how much you understand of the world and how many books you've read i mean i get for example if you if you don't know the smell in the sistine chapel okay you might not know how it smells, but you can still read about things. You can still learn about things. You can still talk to people. The internet's a great tool to use to do that kind of stuff as well. And yeah. again, I've met so many people who aren't particularly keen on traveling for various reasons, um, but I find extremely knowledgeable. And um, I've also met people who travel a lot and are not that well informed of the places they've been to. So yeah. You know, again, the prize is not in in these this number game for me. Um, yeah. In any aspect of life, I think that uh, there can be a richness that we can find uh, in in singularity and in and in understanding a, a depth and mm-hmm. sort of a, a rich cultural awareness of our of our surroundings that are from from our ancestors, from our family, from wherever. And I, I think a contentment can be found in that as well and uh, so i yeah. i would i would never prescribe to anyone learn the amount of or study the amount of languages i've studied or visit the amount of countries i've visited or live in the amount of countries i've lived in because yeah. i i don't think it's a relevant thing to assume that everyone should do what i do yeah i agree yeah absolutely and to close this first part of our chat cuz we're going to have a second part right after this i would just say that's a really nice message, honestly, is that, um, keeping in mind being content. Because I do think that there's always that, uh, I don't even call it a danger, but with the polyglot sort of um, space in general, it, there is always that uh, sort of temptation to add more, add more, add more, mm-hmm. which is fine. And, if, and it depends on what you want, but, there, but it is very helpful to always have in mind this idea of be, like also being content with what you've got with where you are because it can be like a never-ending thing always chasing something else right absolutely absolutely i mean, I mean and, you know the grass is always greener is the kind of syndrome that comes to mind of you know mm-hmm. you always see what you don't have and um this can often affect people negatively and i think especially if we if you know if we do things that are different to other people i think um it's understanding the value of what we've done for ourselves and the value that they've done for themselves. Mm-hmm. And that for me, uh, I, as I say, I've come across so many different people from different backgrounds, different walks of life with different histories and desires and wishes and interests. And mm-hmm. I cannot honestly say that one thing is better than another, that yeah. they are quite honestly different. I mean, of course, I would encourage people to learn about language and learn languages because I love my passion, right? So I yeah. would always say, if you want to talk about it, then I'm happy to share uh, my my love of language. But equally, I'm also happy to share with you your passion for whatever you want. Mm-hmm.